good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I am your podcast host, Danny Vicent, and this is Coffee and Conversations, a place where we explore topics in technology, leadership, and innovation, discussions about things that are keeping you up at night with industry experts, technology experts, and so much more. So grab your cup of coffee and join us as we dive in. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Thank you all for joining another Coffee and Conversations. Today, I have two gentlemen who are bringing their expertise to us in the industry of mining. Uh, and, and I think that's where we're going to start with a question on that. But I'm going to let these fabulous guests introduce themselves. And Roland, why don't we start with you? Why don't we tell the audience who you are and, and why you joined the podcast? Sure. I'm, I'm part of Cisco's uh, industry team. And uh, I, uh, I have global responsibility for the use cases in, in mining um, and work with our field teams at Cisco um, around the world uh, to, um, to apply Cisco's technology to mining use cases. Awesome. Welcome. Bruce, how about you? Yeah, my name is uh, Bruce Frederick, and I'm in the uh, Cisco Internet of Things business unit. And my responsibility is around mining and building the Cisco validated designs with our partners and our systems to... Uh, Supply a end to end use case uh, for our customers to be able to deploy. Awesome. You know, one of my promises to the audience has always been to be, bring brilliant people onto the podcast and right out the gate, you guys, you guys are, you guys are pretty awesome. So I'm going to enjoy this. Okay. I do want to start with 1 really high level question um, and it's going to be somewhat comical, but also somewhat serious here. Now, when I think of a miner, I think of a guy, hard hat, little candle on here with a pickaxe walking down a hole into the ground. That's not really the case. Today's today's leveraging technology left and right. So yeah. why don't we start with a high level? What what is mining, and 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 why do we care? Yeah, who, who wants to start? Maybe I will because I'm more the big picture guy. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> and then we'll get into the details. Bruce has been in so many mines that he's going to be able to tell you the the real nitty gritty. Awesome. But at, at a high level, um, really, we've seen mining. Um, just changed dramatically in the last probably 10 years or so. Um, before that, it, I think it was relatively static from a, from a how they did things perspective, probably for 20, 20 plus years, maybe even more than that. Uh, it's kind of been ramping up. But the last 10 years has been just really crazy how fast technology has been adopted in the mining industry. Just to give you an idea, one of the craziest things that's happened in mining, I think, is is the fact that we've got these massive trucks that can carry 400 tons worth of rock and they're driving or like they they're the size of a three-story building and they're driving around by themselves with no driver so it's it, it's really kind of mind-boggling how yeah. far the technologies come in mining so yeah you're right this isn't mining you know miners with buckets anymore that's awesome yeah, I think to add to that, Danny and, and Roland, one of the other things to think about is that, you know, the, the efficiency that the technology has brought to mining has been just uh, exponential. Uh, as a, a great example, by going with a digital dispatch system that looks at best routes between shovel, dump, uh, primary crusher, and everything else, you know, our customers are seeing millions of dollars in savings in fuel missed yeah. routes alone. And on top of missed routes, if you think about seeing enough money to put the entire IT infrastructure in place and to have an ROI in less than six months on missed That's routes incredible. alone is incredible. Yeah. But if you add to that, say that there's a mistake and you have some, you know, some uh, uh, high concentrate ore and you dump it into a, a trash heap, you just lost that entire 400 tons yeah. of, of high concentrate ore. And if you take overburden, which is has no ore value to it, and you dump it into a crusher, you just tied up your entire crusher and your entire system on 400 tons of garbage going through it. Oh, wow. So th those are two things that, you know, I mean, dramatically uh, and very easily changed in the industry. And, and, you know, I know in our previous conversations, you all brought this up. So I think it's important that we talk about it a little bit with the audience. And that is the, the necessity of mining for our green initiatives and sustainability oh, yeah. forward. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about why that's such a priority and what we're doing and seeing in mining for, for, from a green perspective. I, maybe uh, I'll start with a stat. Um, I, I heard this last week from uh, what our sustainability expert in industry. 
and she had she had done uh, some reading and um, and one of the the large uh, analyst firms. Uh, actually identified that uh, to to meet the need of all of the sustainability um, infrastructure that needs to be built out, uh, just the metals and minerals that are needed to do that build out, we're going to need over 350 new mines to do the lithium and the copper and the cobalt and all of these minerals. Now, I talked to a mining expert since then, and they kind of disputed those numbers, but it's a huge number of mines. Um, that are going to be needed worldwide to, to meet the demand that we're seeing from um, sustainability efforts, for sure. Yeah, and that number that was brought up, Roland, was over 350 new mines in North America. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, that's just, yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think there's a lot of association. I mean, people have pictures, right? I mean, you talked earlier about... The, the whole pick that pickaxe over the shoulder picture that people kind of have in their heads. I think people also have in their heads that um, that, that mining companies destroy the earth and yeah. somehow or other there's um, you know that there's really not a lot of care for the environment in mining. And certainly my involvement with mining companies has not been that. Like when I take a look at at uh, yeah, the, mining is done on a huge scale that most of us can't really fathom in daily life. But really, when you look at the amount of money that's spent in terms of re, you know, reestablishing environments and reestablishing nature the way it was before the miners showed up, um, and just all of the precision, um, op you know, operation that goes on to to make sure that water sources are protected and all of that, it, it's it's really quite staggering how far we've come from from the old rip and tear. Uh, approaches that that maybe happened a hundred years ago, right? Yeah, I I agree, Roland. I think that you know the stewardship of the land has been really brought into play with with today's modern mining. Uh, we look at what happened back in the eighteen hundreds and some of the large tier one miners that have acquired a lot of those old organizations are are going back through and doing reclamation and trying to yeah. you know return the land to a, a usable state. And there's a lot of technology around that too. You know, if you look at some of the reclamation guys that are running some of the dozers, they're using GPS sensors, one on each side of the dozer blade, so it can automatically adjust the grade so that the, the water flow goes exactly right, so they can put some topsoil and put plants and everything else on top of it. That's awesome. So, you know, as, as you're talking about the the land. I would imagine, you know, my again, my perception of, of mining here is that the other the other thing there is it's very dangerous. And so I would imagine a tremendous amount of technology is going in for the safety of these miners. And you talked about autonomous vehicles and these trucks driving around without a driver. There's got to be more to it of that. And so oh, I'd like to like yeah. to jump into a little bit of how are we seeing technology from a safety perspective for the for actual folks in these mines. Well, Bruce talked about the the fuel savings earlier, right? For for autonomous uh, a, a alone. The other thing that we're seeing is usually, usually when a mine engineer maps out the geology of where they're going to mine uh, uh, product or ore, um, the there's usually areas where they're going. Well, the geology here is just not going to work for our human operated equipment to go into. Like the risks are just too high, and so they actually will cross out areas that that are just no go zones. Well. When as soon as you start working with autonomy, that equation you know changes significantly because now your risk profile is really more about the loss of equipment, and you don't have the people equation in there, right? Uh, sure, you don't want to lose a dozer uh, because some wall caved in on it, but honestly, you're going to take more risks with that if the payout is substantial, right? And so the, you're absolutely right. It changes the risk profile when you start to apply technology to it. I'll, I'll let Bruce comment on some of the other components of that, but certainly that's a it's kind of low hanging fruit from an autonomy perspective, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's great, great example. You know, even when we talk about teleremote and not full full autonomy, yeah. you know, teleremote dozing uh, in some of these, you know, hot mines underground, the the temperatures are are so high that. You can't put an operator in a, a vehicle for more than about 20 minutes and you got to put them back into a refuge chamber and let them get back environmentally. And it's very damaging to a human to be in yeah. that super hot and then cool back down. But if you could put them into like, you know, uh, a gaming chair and they can <laughs> control that dozer 
from from the ground, you know, from a, from above ground. And like Roland said, some of these wet muck mines, they're very unstable. They're in areas that, you know, you wouldn't send a person into because of the danger off of it. But if I could send a dozer in there, I mean, losing a dozer is it, it's a kind of a big deal. Losing a person is huge. Yeah, of course. And if you look at above ground, you know, we use gravity fed stackers to to feed some of the processing plants. And to be able to get that ore to go in the right space, you put a dozer on top of this stacker pile and you have an operator running around on there. There's a huge danger of a cave in, right? From a hollow yeah. spot. You put a remote dozer on there, the guy runs it around. If it falls in, you send another dozer out there to pull it back out and start it back up again. That's you awesome. Know, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> and then yeah. if you do have to put people in harm's way, say you don't have autonomous haulage yet, but you have digital dispatch. Yeah. There's yeah. systems that do fatigue stress monitoring systems that will yeah. monitor the corner of the driver's eyes and their mouths to see if they nod off. And it will shake the chair and alert them. It'll alert oh, the dispatcher. Cool. And, you know, the dispatcher could call back out to, you know, like haul truck 29, are you okay? Do you need to take a break? Do you need to go ahead and, and get out and, and get some fresh air? You know, like, like uh, Roland was saying earlier, you know, the, the idea that, uh, that mining is this crude, um, tearing up the ground and everything else really is not the case today. You know, the, the idea of every miner returning home in the same condition in which they came to work is a huge, huge thing. And the stewardship of the land is also a huge thing. That's awesome. Folks, I, I'm going to remind you on this one. Um, we have a plethora of links down below, like we do in every podcast. Uh, as you are hearing these gentlemen talk about this, this uh, fascinating world, I'm sure you're having questions. Hopefully, they're the same questions I have, and I'll get those answers to you in the next few <laughs> minutes. But if not, please click those links down below, dive in, and then, as always, we have as the Ask Us Anything button. So please click that, get your questions answered, and I promise I will keep Bruce and uh, Roland busy this weekend with all of your <laughs> questions. Uh, guys, I do, I do want to jump into something, because you both have mentioned it, um, that there's this perception of this crude way of doing it. But I, uh, mining, from our conversation, seems to be very precision-driven. Like, they know exactly where they're going with this. Can we talk about the technology that's enabling that aspect? Yeah. Oh, where do we start? You want you want to try this one, Bruce? I, I've got a yeah. few thoughts, but yeah, we could we could start out. You know, I mean, uh, companies that do exploration and everything else, they'll go out and pull core samples, and they'll get you know where the ore bodies are at, and and the different things off of that, and then the the mine planning will start to build a mine plan around that. Then they'll start to work at how they want to get to that ore body, whether it's an open pit below ground. Uh, but then on top of that, if they're doing, for example, open pit where they have to do blasting to get it. They use ammonium nitrate and diesel oil fuel with exciters to, to blast this. And Danny and I, uh, we were talking about this last week where, you know, they, they drill uh, blast patterns that can be between three and 300 holes. And uh, it's the same type of chemical that was used, Timothy McVeigh used in the, the bombing of Oklahoma City. And each one of the holes is about 400 times as powerful is what Timothy McVeigh used in Oklahoma City. Yeah, that's crazy. So there's a huge amount of energy. And so obviously you want to get the rock to a state in which it's small enough to either go onto the conveyor belt or onto a haul truck. You don't want to make it too small because you waste diesel oil fuel and ammonium nitrate then. And you don't want it too big because then you got to send a rock breaker out to go and make it smaller to get on the truck. So on the shovels, they use these frag cams that look at the size of the fragment off to the side. That feeds automatically back into mine planning. Mine planning then can adjust and say, okay, we made a mistake. This rock is actually harder than we thought, or it's actually a softer rock. So now blasting can now change their mixture, ammonium nitrate and diesel oil fuel. And so that's how the closed loop systems work completely around that mine planning. The roads are changing. They work with the, you know, the on-site IT guys to move trailers. So communication is, is where they need it to be. They have to move trailers in and out of the blast zones back and forth. And so it's this coordinated effort between mine planning, between blasting, between operations, between IT. And what a, what a huge dance it is to have mm -hmm. you know, a site in the middle of nowhere where you're housing all the people that, that work out there, you know, you're generating your own electricity, you're taking care of your own water purification, you're taking care of, you know, all, everything else, and they coordinate all that together. So I, it's, it's huge. Wow. Huge. Yeah, right, I know, a, yeah, there's some follow-ups there. Off I've got a before I step off on that, Roland, let me yeah, just add one more quick thing. If you look at, like, uh, Arequipa uh, in Peru, the Arequipa region, 
In, in the country of Peru, the Arequipa region is the only area in which sustainable potable water is available 24 hours a day. Mm. And that is because of the mining company that's down there in the Cerro Verde mine that has put in water purification plants for the entire Arequipa region. And so when we talk about sustainability and giving back and, and taking care of stewardship of the land, you know, that's just one of the examples. There's hundreds and hundreds of examples like that. Yeah, maybe back to the precision thing a little bit. And I, I do want to uh, expand a bit on that that community uh, engagement piece. But the uh, on the precision piece, um, I've I've actually been working with um, with a, a digital twin company um, out of Montreal in Canada. And they've actually taken their video game experience because they started out as video game designers and they have a, they have a whole 3D modeling um, uh, patented technology that they've put together for, for um, really it started with 3D games, right? Because you'd, you get these big guns and they shoot up environments and, and rocks get blown off the side of a cliff. And, and they want to make sure that everything inside that rock is modeled so that when it blows apart, they can actually accurately depict all of that. Well, okay, um, I don't know what the business model is around rocks and video games, but one day the light bulb went on and they said, wait a second, there's other people that are modeling all of this dirt and rock and stuff. Yeah. And they started talking to mining companies and they're now actually partnering with a number of very large mining companies in Australia where they take these core samples that Bruce talked about and they actually map all of that data into their 3D environment. They do LIDAR scans of the mine and they put all of this 3D data into their, into their data structure and they're able to model back what the whole mining environment looks like and their mine engineers can actually tour through the dirt to see kind of how the, how the different ore bodies are laid out what rock structures are in the way of getting to those ore bodies like it's 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 actually a pretty uh, uh pretty crazy how involved the technology is just even at the discovery phase before they put the shovel in the ground right um the other kind of cool technology that i'll build off of what bruce was saying is in in some cases uh we've we've been uh, talking to a company that has an x-ray um, an, an X-ray sensor that they can put in the shovel, and it, and this is specifically for metallic mines because uh, that's what the the X-ray works with. But it can tell you when the shovel picks up a load of, of ore, it can tell you the grade of that ore oh, wow. um, with the X-ray sensor. And so what it will do is it will hand off that that ore concentrate data, like the percentage of ore, um, and 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 when it dumps in the truck, it'll tell the truck where to go, what pile to put it in, or whether it goes directly into processing. So if they hit part of the seam that's not as rich, um, then they can stockpile that for later processing, and then they'll use the higher percentage or will go directly into the processing mill, right? So that gives you an idea of the level of precision that, that's, uh, uh, that's actually been incorporated into some of the mining processes. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's a great example, Roland. And, and they feed that information back into either mine planning or the digital twin that they yeah. pull from those things to start making corrections. Maybe they made a mistake somewhere and they can then correct instead of correcting next week. You know, you correct today. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you guys are, you guys legitimately, this is one of the coolest conversations I've had in a while. I'm really enjoying this. And if there's an uptick of people going into mining, you, you guys are responsible. For this. <laughs> this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Okay. So, uh, as you guys are talking about all of these varying technologies that are all over these mines, and maybe it's the Cisco in me, but I've got to I've got to say that there's got to be a network behind it. There's got to be something behind it to make sure these things happen. Because obviously, if communication stops, and to your point, even though the facial recognition tags the guy who's no longer driving, if you can't communicate him, hey, are you okay? Is everything all right? There's a break there, and something bad can happen. Or if that that X-ray shovel or or whatever is not communicating back, that's an issue. And so I would imagine. There's a large play where Cisco's making sure that this is all working seamlessly. And I'd like to jump into that a little bit if we can. Sure. You, do you want to describe the AOZ and kind of how the whole autonomous thing works, Bruce? I know you're probably more like familiar that. with it, but there's a whole sequence of events that happens when communication doesn't work. And that gives you a bit of an idea of the severity. 
Yeah, for sure. But I think that I, I'd like to step back to a little bit bigger picture okay. off of it too. So, you know, I, I think that one of the bigger pictures is that as they start moving the earth around, as you start digging down, whether you're in tunnels or whatever else, you know, there's a possibility of instability to occur. And so they use various sensors, uh, various systems, and the slopes guys, they monitor all this type of stuff. So you have strain gauges, you have radar systems, you have, you know, heat systems. There's a, an IBIS system that's just amazing. It, it sends out um, uh, radio frequencies, and it will pick up the temperature from rocks moving down the side of the slope. Yeah. Oh, and wow. so from that temperature map, you could tell if there's going to be like a slope instability. And usually yeah. they get between somewhere between 24, 72, 96 hours of advance notice. So you could get people out of harm's yeah. way. Oh, and wow. if you don't have that yeah. communication coming back and forth, yeah. that's a huge thing, right? On top of that, then you have to take the overburden, the ore that has no grade value, no concentrate in it, and you put it somewhere. So you stack this all up. Maybe there's a, a earthquake, maybe there's a big storm, you know, whatever else that causes instability. This could be another huge problem to, to have safety around. So they put yeah. sensors in, and in the olden days, you had a guy that got in a vehicle, he would drive out to each one of these sensors, he would get out of his vehicle, he would go out and he would measure with a digital volt ohm meter, write down the value, he would do yeah. that on every sensor, then he would drive back to the office, and he'd either put in a log book or an Excel spreadsheet or something else, and then you know from that they could start to compare data. Well, that's really cool unless you have a slope failure, while he's driving back to the office, that's not going to help you out. Yep. So one of the things that Cisco has done is we start to provide the pipeline to be able to get the sensor data back into it in real time yep. and use what I like to refer to as perishable data. And I'll refer to this, this term several times as we talk through, but slopes, uh, overburden, uh, tailings, these all have a lot of perishable data on them. And let me explain what I mean by that. If I have a sensor that tells you that there's a, a tailings dam that is in jeopardy of failing, and I yeah. tell you that it could fail in the next 12 hours, and you get out there and fix it, that's great information. If I tell you five hours after the tailings dam has failed, hmm. and you flooded all of the tailings into a river, into the ocean, flooded out an entire city, you know, destroyed wow. an entire city, then that's not that great of data. That information that I'm giving you now has already perished, right? So as perishable data, the, the more urgent it is, the more value it has. So Cisco has a system called uh, LoRaWAN, which is for long-range WAN, sending very small amount of data across. And this has been revolutionary to the mining industry where I don't have to send a guy out to drive now. I put a sensor with a LoRaWAN, it could be several miles away. And this sensor could be on a battery that's going to last several hours or several years on one battery for it. Yeah. And from that, then what we can do is bring that data back in immediately and let everybody know if there's any problem off of it. That's that's just one in a big over picture of it, right? Yeah. Now, if we start to look at even closer as we get into what Roland was talking about, now we start to try to figure out how can I take users out of the danger zone. How can I start to create an AOZ, an autonomous operation zone? Mm. And so in this autonomous operation zone, I need to make sure that every vehicle is aware, spatial aware of every other vehicle in the AOZ. So therefore, I can't allow anybody to go in the AOZ in anything, whether they're going in a dozer, whether they're going in a shovel, whether they're going in a light duty vehicle, whether they're going in a golf cart. I can't allow them in the AOZ unless I know exactly spatially aware they're yeah. at, uh, that so that every vehicle can work around it. And now imagine if I lose communication on one truck, so the, the wireless, let's say the wireless on the truck, it hits a rock and breaks the antenna on the truck, and I lose communication on that truck, I need to shut down the entire D, uh, AOZ then, because I don't know where that truck went. Right, I'm already shutting the truck down. The truck has all kinds of safety features on it. It has heartbeats that I know that if I have the onboard process control network off of it, it talks to the wayside offboard, you know, the infrastructure side. And if they don't talk back and forth in a certain amount of time, the truck will shut down. But then where did that truck shut down? That's, that's a concern to me because now I can't get a GPS reading off of it. So all my other vehicles in that area need to shut down until I can go out and visually verify where it's at, get it back on the network. Mm. And so that's that's how critical the infrastructure and the communication 
that Cisco Network provides to our mining customers for both, whether it's small data in lower WAN, whether it's long range off of it, whether it's in the AOZ where it has to be immediate back and forth and there's video going across that, there's a lot of huge data information going back and forth at any given time. Uh, so those are some of the examples. Roland, would you like to add to, yeah, to I, those? Yeah, I mean, I'll just put a bit of a point on that. Like, I, I think um, there's there's a bit of confusion out there around what autonomous actually means. Like, you think autonomous actually means you can do everything by yourself, right, as a vehicle. And and I think where we get that from is, like, Tesla cars and stuff, right, where they don't have to really communicate with anybody else. They kind of send out, you know, feelers to see what's around them. Uh, both from a visual and and lidar and other things, right? You 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 kind of make decisions in your own environment, right? Um, that's not how autonomous and teleremote work in a mining environment. Like there's very maybe someday we'll get to that and where it is maybe more true to the word autonomous, but today it's very very much dependent on that tether, on that communication tether, right? Because it does not in you know, intuitively have awareness of what else is going on in the environment. Mm. It can, it, it can mostly do collision avoidance and stuff on its own, but there's no communication between the vehicles that can, that can today at least um, do its own mapping of that. It all has to be mapped centrally at this point, right? And so, uh, I mean, as a it's not just kind of a hard shutdown as soon as someone loses communication either. Uh, I mean, there's a fairly sophisticated formula that says like, uh, if a truck is moving at a certain, you know, speed, then they can make a fairly safe assumption that it probably hasn't moved further than what that speed would allow it to move. And so it'll, it'll kind of progressively shut things down further and further away from it. And, you know, um, until kind of the whole autonomous zone is, is, in question, right? And so it is a progressive thing, um, and there is a certain amount of time that we have to reestablish communication, but it's really critically important. Like, as soon as that one truck shuts down, it's a cascading thing, and it can it can cost millions of dollars within minutes. Like, it, it's, it's crazy just in production. This isn't in sort of damaging equipment. This is just production not happening can cost the company millions of dollars if they lose communication to that vehicle. Wow. Yeah. Folks, I, I'm going to remind you one more time. We do have a plethora of links down below. Please click those dive in. Uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of information here and a lot of complexity to these systems. Uh, and, and I'm sure you're going to have questions. So my final reminder, there's that ask me anything. Please get your questions in and we will try to get back. The more questions you give me, the more I can entice these guys to get on a, another podcast and give us some more information. So. Okay, so I, I want to continue on this, this communications conversation we're having here, because largely what we're talking about so far is from an IT world, is how the communication is communicating with these, these, these sensors, these vehicles, those kind of things. But I would imagine it's got implications that span into the business side of the equation as well. So, Roland, is, is, what are we seeing in that, in that space? Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, a lot of times when, when as Cisco, uh, where we've spent a lot of our time over the years is really just connecting sites, right? And a lot of times the IT teams are, are uh, responsible for these wide area network connections. That's actually a very real problem in mining too, because mines tend to be in the middle of nowhere, right? And every once in a while you have a mine that's like right beside a city, but almost always it's on top of a mountain or uh, in the middle of the tundra or like there's, it's just not friendly places to communicate with, right? And so uh, now there's a little bit of a game changer with low earth orbit um, satellites and there's more options, um, but but generally speaking, even with low Earth orbit, um, it's it's not super um, dependable, right? You still have breaks in the communication, and so although the rest of the IT world has gone to cloud applications, um, mining companies by and large are very careful about what they put in the cloud and what they don't, right? So we were talking about it you know, haul trucks before, you're not going to be putting that haul truck application in the cloud sure. um, because you don't know when your connection might go out for a couple of hours, right? And so so that, that becomes actually a really important design criteria in terms of getting a lot of that communication and control and smarts locally in the mine. You definitely want to have some of the policy stuff centrally located because you want to be able to harmonize that across all of your different sites. 
but but from an architecture perspective you have to realize communication is not that awesome coming from a lot of these sites the other thing i'll 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 identify in that in that vein i guess is that um even though that when that wide area network connection um is critical you're really now talking about much more importance on the local communications, whether that's fiber communications, whether it's wireless communications, and and the uh, and all of the different devices that tie all that together within the mine, right? So that becomes a bigger conversation. Um, even even communication between sensors on a on a vehicle, like these haul trucks come from the factory with you know hundreds of sensors, maybe even a, closer to a thousand sensors, right? And um, and so how do all of those tie together and then communicate off of the vehicle or get logged somewhere? How do you deal with that volume of data? And that's just the vehicles, right? Now, um, Bruce talked about, uh, about tailings ponds. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is electrification, right? Is mm -hmm is with sustainable efforts going on, a lot of these trucks are starting to move from fossil fuel uh, drive trains to electric drive trains. Well, now all of a sudden your power requirement in the mine starts to grow pretty substantially. Um, all the modern power systems out there that utilities are using all require communication to all of these monitoring points, right? So now you have communication requirements to all the substations. There's a whole power monitoring network that needs to be put in as well. Um, so you end up starting to create like four or five different bespoke networks. And, and all of a sudden you're starting to make some judgment calls as to what of this can actually live on the same communication channels and what parts of it need to be separate. And then you start to have the, the security conversation as to what, which of these can be in the same security zone, which ones need to be separate um, just from a security risk perspective. So it gets pretty involved as we start to connect all of these things. And I didn't know, I'm not sure where you wanted to go with that, but that's, it gives you a bit of an idea of how complex the communication systems and some of these mines starts to become, right? Yeah, that, that's a, an amazing uh, uh, overview on it too, Roland. It's just such a, such a balancing act, right? It, it really is like we talked about earlier about perishable data. So once again, you know, like say, I give you information on a transmission on a 797 haul truck. And I tell you that yeah. this transmission is, you know, in imminent danger of, of failing. That information, yeah. because of the, the big data analysis off of it, probably needs to come from a cloud, from like a data lake or something yeah. like that, where you can compare all of that, which is in the cloud area. I still need to have sites just uh, sustainability in case I can't yeah. connect to it. But if I can, if I could tell you in advance of a transmission blowing up and it cost you, you know, one tenth, one twentieth of the, the cost to fix that transmission, or if I tell you after it blows up and the truck is sitting on the side of the road with 400 tons of ore sitting in it, that now you got to figure out how to get out of it, that, that's a big data. That that data just perished on you, right? Uh, and same thing with what Roland. Now I want to get that perishable data to a cloud, and the only way to get it there is through a connectivity through SD WAN. Well, if I can send data out, there better be security in place so that somebody can't come yeah. in. And take over, especially I got power plants, they could shut down yeah. power plants, they could shut down water treatment facilities, they could do, you know, all kinds of uh, bad stuff. They could, uh, you know, take pipe, pipelines hostage and then hold them for ransomware. We, right. We've seen all this type of stuff happen, right? So what, what a great intro on this balancing act between how do you keep site sustainability, how do you get the data out to a data lake, or a historian or to wherever your, your big thinkers are at to be able to do it. As another perfect example in the process control network on a mine, mm -hmm. let's, let's say that you can compare a, a sag mill or a ball mill, you could compare the data off of that. So if you looked at the data off of a yeah. sag mill or a ball mill, you have one data point. If I looked at it over 10,000 ball mills, I could find an anomaly on one and repair that. Or if I looked at processing control plan number one in the, the DRC compared to processing control number two in Australia compared to processing control in three in, in uh, you know, Peru, and one of them is operating at like 20% deficiency to the other two, what's different? How do I fix that? And so those are ways of balancing. And once again, yeah. if you're going to send data out, 
you better be dang sure you can protect somebody bad coming in. Mm. You, you know, folks, uh, like anything, when we, we were prepping for these podcasts, as the host, you think through several questions and you get these questions down and you're, you're going to figure this out. And every once in a while, you ask a question and then your guests give you so much information that now I've got 8,500 <laughs> questions I need to follow up with on this one. There's so much information here. Uh, and I'm sure you have questions as well. So last reminder, I promise, uh, ask us anything down below and we'll leverage that to get these guys on the, uh, on the podcast again. Um, I do want to jump in on something. So you, we, we talked about everything there, and you mentioned something a while ago, Roman. It was it was about a, a loss of revenue in the moment mm -hmm. with one of these breaches. But I would imagine it's not just from a protection of revenue or, or something along those lines, but it's actually making processes and and, and operations more yeah. efficient. And so I'd like yeah. to jump into that a little bit and and kind of continue to make, take the business side and make them happy. Let's let's talk about operational yeah. efficiencies and process efficiencies and what we're seeing in that world. Yeah, it's absolutely both sides of it, right? Uh, um, I, the, probably the most popular example of, uh, of, loss of loss of revenue is that haul truck stopping, right? But you could apply exactly the same rationale to a conveyor belt, you know, um, stopping or slowing down or uh, an outage on a pump or like there's so many different examples that are uh, very classic industrial examples of where where a piece of machinery is in the critical path of production, right? And that's definitely the case in mining as well. And um, and the more information we can get off of that, you can do some really really simple predictive maintenance. Like it, you can do some really complex stuff, like the you know transmission example that that Bruce gave earlier. But just even uh, simple vibration monitoring on anything that's rotating. Um, can tell you whether the, you know a, a bearing is starting to go or not, right? So even just putting a vibration monitor with the LoRaWAN technology that Bruce was talking about earlier, you can put that on any motor or pump or or bearing that's rotating, and uh, and either the heat signature or the vibration signature will tell you before you have to actually stop everything in an emergency. You can actually schedule it into a maintenance cycle, and that that saves a ton of money in terms of unplanned downtime not having to occur, right? So that's that's maybe the first piece is how to avoid things stopping, right? That's uh, awesome, Roland. Yeah, on uh, the other side, uh, I don't know if you want to comment on, on some more examples. I, I would, there, Bruce, just but, one quick comment on yeah. your, your statement on the conveyor belt, which is, uh, you know, like some of these conveyor belts are multi-kilometers long, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. And if you have if you have a bearing that goes out and causes a conveyor belt to stop, now you have two, three, four kilometers of ore sitting on a conveyor belt. Yeah. yeah. You can't just start it up. You've got to send somebody out there with a shovel to get that ore yeah. off the conveyor belt before you can start it back up. Like yeah. Roland was talking about, if you knew the bearing needed it during a scheduled maintenance window and you replaced it then when the ore is not on the belt, you've already emptied the belt. Yeah. You know, that, that's a manpower overall equipment efficiency, you know, the this cost savings off of that is huge. Wow. So, sorry, Roland, go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that's that's bang on. Like, that's that's a great example of where you can't just start stuff up again, right? So <laughs> that, being able to schedule it is huge, right? Um, the other the other angle that I wanted to take on this is the optimization angle that you had referred to, Danny. And, and that is um, all of a sudden you can, if you have the data, you can move much closer to 100%, right? And and uh, we see this in uh, in manufacturing and, and other industries as well, right? Where you, if you're efficient, you're running maybe 80% efficiency on a particular process, but now if you all of a sudden get much more accurate data, you can start to tune your parameters so you can get much closer to 100% utilization on uh, on the process that you've got, right? And that's true in mining as well. Right, I mean, a, a, kind of a bit of a humorous example maybe is is the way they they design haul truck roads, right? If you, if you know any haul truck drivers, you know they're not necessarily precision individuals, right? And um, and and the haul truck roads need to be designed pretty wide if you've got humans running the haul trucks. If all of a sudden now you've got autonomous vehicles running on that haul truck. Those those roads, I don't know what the percentage is, Bruce, but those haul trucks roads can get a lot narrower, right? Because because these trucks run much more precisely along a path. In fact, they have to introduce random 
um, random variables into the algorithms so that the trucks move back and forth a little bit so they don't dig ruts in the roads, right? So, it, I mean, there's some of the stuff you wouldn't think of until, until they start doing it. And then yeah. they go, oh, wait a second, that's not going to work. We're going to have to actually put in some variables here to make sure that we don't end up with ruts in the road. But the savings comes in now you don't have to build this big, huge, wide road. And you can build it steeper so that it can be shorter, right? So some of this optimization stuff is very real in terms of being able to pull more, uh, you know, pull more product out of the ground with less resources. Um, any examples you want to highlight there? I'll, I'll dovetail on that one, Roland, with uh, an underground example. So, you know, some of these underground mines are, are huge. And so if I want to get an operator on a yeah. dozer or a truck into one of those, I have to bring them from where they're being housed in the, the housing facility. Maybe then that's a, you know, 45-minute drive out to the mine, to the, to the man tunnel to get them into it, to get them into the mine. Then maybe that's another hour to get them down in the shaft area, to down to where the equipment is. So now I've wasted an hour and five minutes that I'm paying somebody because they're on the clock when we start rolling them out, right? So I've wasted an hour and 45 minutes to get them down to just operate the vehicle. If I go tell remote, they roll out of bed, walk next door in their flip flops, <laughs> and they're able to sit down in, in the, the, the gaming chair and start operating that equipment. I mean, not, not only did I take them out of harm's way, which is the number one concern, but now I've, I've yeah. made it where I can operate that equipment 24 hours a day because now I can operate, I can move. Mm -hmm. I no longer am limited to how many operators can I get to go out to this extreme remote location to go down to the bottom of a shaft and start driving around a heavy piece of equipment. Now, now I can have one operator in a, a, a gamer chair control four dozers. Because once he goes on a track, I can let that one go and pick up the second dozer and start controlling him. I can do that across, you know, multiple ones, and I'm not having to worry about transport them from housing all the way out to the mine entry, all the way down to it. Huge savings on, on efficiency. Well, well, folks, um, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you there's links and ask me anything. You're probably already on there because you're like me and you've got a hundred questions for these guys. Um, <laughs> But uh, we have come to, as you all know, my favorite part of the podcast. And uh, and this being your guys' first time on here, you don't know what I'm about to say, but it's I'm going to throw you on one that's unscheduled. So if you're like me, you prepped last night. You thought, okay, Danny's going to ask me this question, and and I'm going to answer this way, and and inevitably because I'm I'm me, I, I I didn't ask you those questions, and I and I and I didn't go the flow that you thought I was going to go. So this is your opportunity to freestyle. So if there is one thing that you want our audience to take away from today's podcast, what is that one thing? And, and I'll let you guys choose who goes first or I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> I'll go first. I, I think that the one thing that I would, I would take away is that the more data that we can get for big data analysis, for artificial intelligence, machine learning, the better efficiency that we can bring that around. And then the second side of that sword is that the more data you get out, you better protect it so that nothing comes back wow. in and hold your data hostage. Yeah. I love that. Roland, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go in a bit of a different direction, but I, I think what I would say is, is uh, I, would, I would want people to, who haven't ever thought that they would want to be involved in mining, to actually think about that a little bit, right? Because... Um, <clears throat> A lot of, you know, there's a lot of different things that keep people from getting involved in the mining industry. Um, and we talked about some of those today, the, the, you know, the stereotypical images of, of, you know, dirty faces and, you know, coal miners coming up with, you know, covered in, in, in coal dust. And, and that's just not how it is anymore. Um, like, if you like, if you like, you know, playing video games all day long, you might be a great dozer driver. Um, right. I mean, th th this is where the paradigm is completely different than it used to be. Right. And, uh, and I, the other thing I would say is if you have a lot of IT experience and you're getting a little bit bored with data centers and and kind of traditional IT stuff, um, you have got 80 percent of what you need to work with operations technology. If you're humble enough to realize you need to actually ask some really good questions and listen for to get the other 20%, you're in a really good spot to actually make a move into some really, really cool stuff. 
right? And so I I would just encourage people to think about that, right? I mean, maybe maybe you know you've got some you know uh, uh, your next career is is something really cool in the mining industry. Well, I, you know, uh, I, I I can tell you both. I, I am genuinely happy after this podcast. I, 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 this is one of the more fun conversations I've had. And, and I truly do probably have 20 questions listed here that I would love to ask you again. Uh, so on behalf of the audience and on myself personally, truly, thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for spending this time with me. Um, and if you're open to it, I'm going to, I'm going to throw some more on here and have you on again. Cause this was a, an absolutely great conversation. <laughs> Sincerely. Awesome. Thank you both. Thanks for having us, Danny. We really yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. We love it. And folks, please don't forget the links down below, the Ask Us Anything. And as always, we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks again.